Hello. Hello, New Orleans. All right. I got my questions. Let me just give me a second here. So he just told me backstage he doesn't want to do what I wanted to do for the first 10 minutes. That's all right. We but, can do but we're going to do, I, I, this is, I mean, just tell, first I'm going to start by um, explaining how we met. Oh, four years ago? About that? Three yeah. years ago? Uh, someone put a gentleman in Moscow in my hands. Uh, I don't know how it happened. That I don't, I don't remember who did that. And I'm usually not, people don't do that very often, but I picked up and I started reading it. And I had two thoughts after about 50 pages. I was totally hooked, um, transfixed, and nothing happened. Yeah, it was like, that's right. It was like, <laughs> why am I transfixed? It was, it was, in my book, something has to happen. You, in your books, nothing has to happen. It, you just, it just works. <laughs> and I couldn't believe how good, I could not believe how good it was. Like I was saying that to you, I can't believe how good this book is. Your name meant nothing to me. Right. It was a little weird, Amor Tolls, <laughs> right? I mean, like, who's named Amor, yeah. right? And, and I get to the back, and somewhere in here, in there, acknowledgments, it says, I'm grateful to Stokely Tolls. Yeah. And I thought, I know a Stokely Tolls. Uh, when I was 14 years old, my friend Peter Conway from here had a mother who insisted on summering in Martha's Vineyard, had got him to a tennis camp through the kids there in, up in New Hampshire, and Peter Conway said, you got to come to tennis camp with me. Stokely Tolls was a bunkmate of his at tennis camp, and I thought, there can't be two of these, right? There can't be yeah. two Stokely Tolls. Yeah. So I got my publisher to get your email. Yeah. This is a very Amor Tolls kind of like yeah. event. And I sent you a note and very quickly it becomes- We became friends. There are two degrees of separation, yeah. every 18 places. And we got along. It, but, but, but so then I, I, I sent an email to my brother and I say, you're not know, gonna believe this. Out of the blue, I got an email you know, from Michael Lewis, uh, the author, and uh, you know, he had recognized uh, dad's name, Stokely Tolls in the book, and he reached out to me and and my brother responds, he goes, that Michael Lewis? He's like, he's like, the guy I knew at camp, is that Michael Lewis? And I was like, yeah, it's the same guy. He couldn't believe it. It was yeah, just like- Irish, just like my friend. Yeah, yeah this yeah. is- at, this, like, no. This all rings true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this all rings true. And so I've read almost everything of yours now. Uh, oddly, this talk is called The Lincoln Highway, and I read yeah. the first 100 pages, again, sucked in, and my wife took the book, and I, I've not seen it back. I will see it back, but I've read all the other ones. Um, but I just like, when I read this thing, I thought, where the hell did you come from? Like, and now I know you're Stokely's brother. I'm still curious. I mean, like, more curious. Like, Stokely's brother did this? And, and so I want to spend, we've not, so when we met, we finally met in person, and it was like we jumped into the middle of a conversation that's not stopped, but we never had the ordinary, like, where you're from, how you're doing. Right. Like, well, how did you get where you... And so I really wanted to do here, I want to understand your career, the beginning of your career. Yeah. Okay. I want to stand... I just don't, I, it's not a lot of time I want to yeah. do, but I want a little time. So, uh, because... Do I you want me to begin now? You can start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Your, your mother warned me about that, Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. She did. Like, last night, yeah, yeah, yeah. his mother was like, you know, watch out, because, you know... Once he so, starts, he doesn't he stop. He doesn't stop. Right. So, no, but I, I began writing fiction as a kid. So I started writing fiction. I became interested in writing fiction at the same time I began to read, which was first grade. And, uh, and so kind of every step of my life, I would read something and write a little and go back and forth. And it was always my ambition uh, to write. I wrote in high school and college and graduate school. And I arrived in New York at the age of 25 with the intention of being a, a novelist. But then I was kind of a little uh, claustrophobic. I was a little lonely, you know, working in my little place. And, uh, and, and I was broke. So I joined a friend of mine who had started an investment firm, and 20 years later, we were still working side by side. So we stopped there. Yeah. So you, you, when do you make a decision you're not going to write for a living? Well, so, so it was just the two of us initially. We were building this firm. So for 10 years, I stopped writing fiction. And the important part of this story is that when I was at Yale, I, uh, we had a visiting writer came to campus. I applied, got into his seminar, and uh, it was Peter Matheson, the great uh, both novelist and naturalist and essayist, and, uh, and he was the first person who said, listen, you know, I, I think you may be gifted at this, and so I'm going to take my time with you very seriously, and I hope you're going to take your time with me very seriously too. 
And that was a big turning point in my life as an artist. And so, when, so Peter and I, I continued to sort of serve as my mentor and ultimately as a friend as I kept, as I went through, finished college, as I went through graduate school and continued to write when I arrived in New York. Well, when I went into the investment business, he was so mad. And he was sort of like, I've given all my time to this kid with promise, and this is what he does? Yeah. And so we would have dinner like once a year, uh, or twice a year, something like that. And he'd be like, oh, okay, you know, so how's, how's the firm? And I'd be like, well, we're, you know, we're bigger than last year. And he'd be like, oh, God. You know, he was hoping for it would fail, right? And so, but then he would say, you know, how's your book? And then I would kind of hem and haw, and he could tell I wasn't doing it. And so we did this for a couple of years. And let's say around the time I was 28 or something like that, we go out to dinner. And at the end of dinner, he said, Amor, let me tell you something. Uh, you know, at this point, he's in his late 60s or something like that. And he says, uh, I'm, I've now known multiple generations of artists of all kinds. And what I can tell you is now, looking back over 50 years, is that when talented young artists in any discipline go to Wall Street, there is something about that career which is compelling enough and fun and pays well enough and the people are interesting enough that once they go, they never come back. And you, as a result, should assume that your life as a writer is over. And he's like, good night. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, wow, you know? And so I, I remember just going home like in a state of like shock, you know? And, but so, and I think I was saying this to your sister last night, is, is the the irony is, or the interesting thing, I guess, is that I had wanted to write fiction my whole life. I loved doing it. I loved it. But it turned out that the love of it wasn't enough to get me back in the habit of doing it. The thing that really got me back into the game was dread. You know, it was, was the dread of waking up at the age of 60 with the ghost of Peter Matheson, you know, <laughs> shaking the chains, you know, and being like, you never did it, you know? Yeah. And so finally, I was like, oh, okay, I got to do this. So I, I, I. And what age is this? Uh, so 25 to 35, basically, I stopped writing. 35, I, I spent seven years writing a novel on the weekends, and which when I was done, I didn't like. And, you know, here's a tip if you spend seven years on a work of art, and at the end of it, you don't like it, you should reflect on that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, so I did. You know, I was like, what went wrong? And, and eventually I was like, okay, this is the way I need to approach writing because this, this, this fell short of my expectations for multiple reasons, but this is how I might be able to solve that. And I took those lessons and then I wrote Rules of Civility. And then when that became a bestseller, I retired from the firm. Well, I, want, I want to march through the books. There are four of them. They're going to be about to be the fourth one. Yeah, that's right. right. But, but before we do that, you know, I can remember being 25 years old and going to work on Wall Street and really wanting to write. And, and my father telling me uh, after two years, and he saw the paycheck, uh, just wait 10 years. Don't, don't quit to write your book. Yeah. Because if you, if you stay there, yeah. you'll be rich enough that you can write whatever you want to write. Yeah. And I can remember I, I very consciously having the thought, looking at the ancient 35-year-olds, yeah. saying, would any of these people yeah. have the ability no, to right. walk out and write a book? Yeah. And the answer was clearly no. Yeah. And so I said, I'm going to be good, that. Good for you. And yeah. so, so I, I, I left. That's right. He has but more some, books than me, and this is why. <laughs> But, 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 but I, somehow you preserved in you something that I didn't think it was preserved. And he didn't, yeah. Peter Matheson didn't think it was preservable yeah. in that environment. And my question is kind of how you did it. Yeah. Well, it comes out of the love of it, you know, yeah. and, and, and it was so deeply ingrained. As soon as I started doing it again, they had that great feeling of it all rushing back. And I, and I got to say, you know, I think all young artists experience this, or you probably do sometimes, but you, there's, there's this great bliss you have when you're really inventing well and, and writing well and it's kind of all the whole world drops away and you can you know now they say it's the flow or whatever you want to call it and but when you're in that experience you know it's an amazing experience it's like the highest bliss I, I have in my life uh, you know aside from my wife and children and but um, when a book is done you, you do have this sort of thing of like am I going to be able to recreate that feeling right. you know when every time you start a project and you have to kind of say I always, I'm not sure about it. There's troubling parts during you getting into it, but it always shows up later if I keep, if I, if I sit down at 
8.30 every morning, the inspiration will show up eventually. You know, it's kind of the way you sort of ultimately think about it. And that's what happened. As I kind of went back into it, I rediscovered sort of both the joy of it, the ability to do it, and I was getting better as I, you know, every year that was going by that I was even while writing that failed book. And what point does it become clear you can, the, the book is, rules of civility is not a failure? Oh, yeah. And well, I, how does your career yeah, start? I, I ended the first draft of rules of civility, and I was like, okay, uh, that's, that's, that is a book I'm proud of. Like the first book, I didn't even hand it out to agents or anything like that. Right. The first, but when I finished Rules of Civility, I was like, this is definitely something that uh, I would be uh, open to, to pursuing an agent because I think it fulfills both my ambitions for what a novel can be, but also is, is a reasonable expression of my abilities, you know. Let's talk about Rules of Civility just for a bit. I yep. actually just finished it a couple of weeks ago. Oh, okay. And right. I went back. Yeah. Uh, rather than, and it, it's, if I'd ask you what your book is about yeah. while you were writing it. Yeah. Because some things happen in that book. But not yeah. a lot. Again, yeah. Yeah. some a lot of pages and a lot yes. of words, and I'm completely transfixed, but not a lot is happening. Yes. And, and your main character is a woman, which yeah. is brave in this day and age uh, to even try to do. It remind, I had, there were writers it reminded me of, none of whom were alive. Uh, it was like a blast from the past. Yeah. But what were you doing? What did you think you were doing with that book? What was it about? Well, I mean, I got I to gotta start by saying that, you know, for me, an idea for a novel or story is, always begins with a really small premise. And uh, in, in the case of Rules of Civility, for those of you who've read it, you'll, you might guess this, for if you haven't, what happens is it opens in the 60s, and a, a woman in middle age with her husband is at an opening at the Museum of Modern Art of, uh, of Walker Evans' photographs, uh, which is a true event. In, what happened is in, in the 1930s, Walker Evans, the great American photographer, took portraits of people on the New York City subways with a camera with a lens poking out of his coat. He would sit across from you, take a portrait of one or two people. He took hundreds of them, and uh, he, when he was done, he, he, he had this incredible portrayal of humanity, um, and he wouldn't share it because he, he felt that he had invaded the privacy of, the, of these citizens. So in 19, almost 30 years later, MoMA said, how about now? Could you share them now? Because, you know, what the heck? And so he said, okay. So they have a big opening, and I, and I was looking at these photographs, and as I was going through them, I thought, oh yeah, what an amazing thing to have been at that opening. And can you imagine if you like you were in late middle life, in, in middle age, and you recognized one of the people in the photograph, an old friend from the 30s. And I kept going through and I thought, oh, even better. What if the person at the opening recognizes the same guy in two pictures, but he's undergone such a transformation over the course of a year that she's the only one at the opening who can tell it's the same guy. You know, and I was like, that's interesting. This is how it starts yeah. in your mind. Yeah, and, well, and that's why I wrote that piece down on a piece of paper, and this is, this is true, I did that at the age of 25. And so when I sat down to write my second novel, you know, to take the second stab at it, I was 40, and I went through the box of little pieces of paper. And there was that piece, and I was like, oh yeah, that's good, let's do that. So, now th so this is important to your question, which is that when I'm like, oh yeah, that's interesting, or promising, or whatever, what that means to me, I have no interest in what its themes are, what it could mean to a reader, you know, uh, uh, an ideological point of view. I, have, I don't even have a sense, care about, I don't know the style or the time period or any of that yet. All I'm interested in is, does this little description resonate with me in a way that I can tell it has the promise to just keep opening up, like opening and opening and opening and opening up, and that therefore I can create something that's rich enough and intricate enough that the reader uh, can lose themselves in it in this interesting way. So, so and, and something about that little story, I'm like, yeah, that, that would do it. But so then you're like, all right, well, that has to take place in the 30s because that's when the photograph was done. It's going to be in New York because that's where the photographs were done. And so you start to hone in on that. And then you start to imagine the events that got uh, the, the main character or one of the main characters tinker from photo one to photo two. Right. And, and, and what I do, I'm a designer, and that, this is part of what I learned in that failed novel. So I will spend, you know, usually about three years or more thinking about the book, taking notes, writing paragraphs before I outline and begin chapter one. 
It's just a design phase. And during the design phase, I ultimately, at the end of the design phase, I will know everything that happens in the book, every setting, every character, their backgrounds, their personalities. I'll have some of the scenes have been sketched out a little bit, some of the conversation. I kind of know the whole thing. And only when I'm there do I say, okay, let's outline it and begin. How do you go from the Walker Evans exhibition to Eve? Where yeah. does Eve come from? So in that book, because you start in 66, so it's a flashback structure. She's remembering the year that this happened to this man who she knew, and then she tells you about that year, when she, you know, 1938, this one year in her life. Her best friend is uh, Eve, is this tr terrific sort of troublesome, uh, no, not, uh, troublemaking. Sorry, Kate Trou and Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, Katie's the main character. And... Uh, I, this often happens to me as soon as I had the idea, just like I said a second ago, in my head it was a guy in the picture and a woman looking at it. And very quickly I had this sense that, oh yeah, she's a sophisticated person in late middle age in New York when she sees it at MoMA at the opening, but at the time she was from a working class background and kind of was, was uh, kept her cards close to her chest. And the story is gonna be about the year in which she begins to climb the social and professional ladder of New York, when she begins to sort of, New York is just beginning to open up for her, and that's what it's gonna be about, and, and she'll tell it, and, uh, and she'll be observing things as she goes, and, and her roommate, you know, is this uh, feisty character to name Eve. Right. It was Kate, actually. I was, yeah, I, you I were thinking about Kate. I'm, yeah. I'm thinking about Kate. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking about Kate because I thought, all right, you've just written a novel that you, for, oh, it's taken you seven years to write a novel yeah. you don't like. Yeah. Uh, it's a bold move to write in the voice of a woman, and yeah. when you when you start out again, yeah, it was and, and you and I was um, I kept waiting for you to embarrass yourself. <laughs> I kept waiting for like you know I don't know she zipped up her yeah. fly or yeah, something yeah 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 you know and, yeah. and you just to for, yeah. you you to forget yeah. and you never forgot yeah it was just it, you were able to it was an, you were able to occupy that woman in yeah. a way that was just shocking. And yeah. I'm wondering where the hell this comes from. Yeah, well, so my, first of all, uh, so a, let me I, I'm, stop I'm you. Glad so say, I'm glad to say, act, yeah. actors have their tricks yes. for getting inside of yes. characters. Yes. What are your tricks for getting inside yes. of a character? Um, so the, the, the best way I can to answer this is that, is that I've been writing fiction since I was a kid. And, and the, the way I think of it is, um, is well, if you think about fiction, or the novel, let's say, for a second, and you compare it to the other great classical art forms that were in the 19th century, like, you know, the uh, classical composition or, or, you know, refined painting like the Hudson uh, uh, River School, the novel, you know, that were being made in the 19th century, um, the, the thing about the Hudson River School paintings is that they are unbelievably good at putting you in a particular place and time, like, instantly. You can see the painting across the room, and you're like, okay, I know where I am. And I don't mean that geographically. I mean, like, you have a sense of the mood of, of the promise of America, or let's say, or of, of the wildness or the beauty of nature. It all comes to you very quickly. And uh, if you think about music, music can deliver you uh, a sense of emotion in, in a matter of seconds. Like, a, a good cellist can make you sad or happy literally in five seconds. You know, by, as the thing starts, you can feel it. And the nature of the novel is that it can do both of these things. It can give you a sense of time and place. It can give you sort of an experience of emotion. Um, it's more cumbersome in how it achieves that than painting or music. Um, but what the novel can do that the other two cannot do is it can put you in the position of another human being. You know, so intimately that as you're reading, uh, if something funny happens to the character, you laugh out loud. You know, if something tragic happens, you may actually shed a tear while you're reading. And you can kind of imagine the world through them and you're bound up into their experience, right? Well, this is a very powerful aspect of the novel since its inception. And so the reason I lay all that out is because as a young writer, if you're gonna master something, you gotta master that, right? Which is how do you bring an individual to life from scratch in a way that feels uh, three-dimensional, uh, realistic, and as compelling, and as intricate as we are as human beings, right? And so, so the way that, that I worked towards, I don't know if I've mastered it, but the way you work towards it is by constantly writing from different perspectives. You know, so as a young person, you're like, okay, I'm gonna, this story's gonna be about, uh, you know, an old violin maker in Vienna. 
in the 1930s. Okay, then now, okay, this one is about a, a young, uh, a woman in Berkeley campus who's at the beginning of feminism in the 60s. Or, or you know, here's a, a young uh, uh, African-American kid, you know, uh, in the Jim Crow area in, in Atlanta. And you would sort of invent the story. And then the challenge was, as you're writing it, is how does, how does the language change to suit this individual? In essence, what is the appropriate vocabulary, the semantics, the you know, the, 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 the poetry of the language. Because for each of those stories, you have to tell them in totally different ways. You would do setting differently, you'd do dialogue differently, you'd deliver themes differently, the poetry of it would be different. So you're practicing, in essence, telling the story from that unique perspective, which has its own tone, et cetera. And slowly, that's about creating these individuals on the page. You know, and, and you get better and better and better at, at, learn, at doing that quickly learning that person, hearing that person, and it really is more about hearing them. I don't sit down and say, 160 pounds, five foot eight, blonde, you know, I don't do that. Yeah. You know, what you're more, it's about, and it's this weird process in the early stages of invention, it looks like a spiral, because you say, okay, this is what I think Katie's like. And then you start to imagine what she's doing, and then suddenly you hit a situation where you're like, oh no, she wouldn't do that, she'd do this. That's when you know you know her. Yeah, because then you're starting to get, you're right, because she's doing something a little unexpec unexpected, and now you're, you're, you're taking what was a flat understanding of her and beginning to stretch it out and make it multidimensional, right? Because we're all shy at some point, right? We're all angry at some point. We're all greedy at some point, right? It's, it's, so you're, we, all those things are woven into us, and suddenly you're writing about a circumstance where that thing suddenly comes out, which could be to her detriment or could be to her credit. And, but my point being that when that happens, you say, oh, wait a second, I know her better. You go back to the beginning. You say, okay, let's start again. So this happens and this happens and this, yeah, and then that happens and, yeah, and then you're like, wait a second, then she does this. Why does she do that? Oh yeah, she does it for that reason. And now you know her better, so you go back to the beginning. You know, and this, the process of design is, is you keep starting again in a way in your head as you're getting to know the character better and better by imagining them in different situations that you haven't been in yet and having her personality and background express themselves through the actions in the events. I was about to, there are three different ways I was gonna ask the same question. And maybe the, it was, like, when, you've been, when you've tried to access or create someone not like yourself, yeah. have you ever hit a wall where I just can't do this person? No. What but, but, what, I, but I think it, you're, you're, it's, 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 you're solving for that as you go, you know what I mean? So like, maybe you shift the character to something that, you, that feels sharper and more confident because maybe you couldn't do that. You know, right. But you're not really registering as a failure to create this. Right. I'm just wondering if you're drifting towards like a, a wheelhouse no, as you're... You know what, I mean, like the Lincoln Highway, and, 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 I, and now I'm, I'm, I don't want to compliment my own work, you know, because that's... Please. But, but, no, but Lincoln Highway is told from eight perspectives. And you start with two, Duchess and Emmett, who are yep. at the center of it. And, uh, and that, for those of you who read that book, a weird thing about that book is that the original design, this multi-year design process, right up until when I was, I'd reached like page 80 in the manuscript, was that the story would be told from Duchess and Emmett, and we'd go back and forth. You hear from Emmett on day one, and then you hear from Duchess shows up and you hear from him on that, later that night. The next day, Emmett goes into town, gets in a fight, Duchess goes into town and witnesses the fight, and it keeps going. Emmett, Duchess, Emmett, Duchess, Emmett, Duchess. And I got like 80 pages in, and I knew the whole cast of characters very well. And, uh, and I thought, you know, this is not gonna work, because the reader is, I know Wooly, and his, gr I love Wooly, and I love Sally, and I love Billy, and I understand the intricacies of who they are as human beings, the reader will never have the full appreciation of who they are if I just let Duchess and Emmett tell the story. Because they don't know them as well as I do, let's say. Mm -hmm. So the only way this is really gonna fulfill its promise is if I start telling the story from all eight perspectives and let, each, let the reader inside to the interior life of each of these characters. So, so my point of this is that I, I, at no point in doing that did I, did I be like, oh, now I have to change the character because I'm never going to bring that guy to life. Right. You know, you just keep, you go, you're in. You're like, okay, I know Ulysses, I know Billy, I know Sally. And so you start to build it out and then the thing gets, it got so much more interesting by virtue of that. And I didn't change any of the order of events. I just changed who was describing a particular event. Right. And that was hugely advantageous to me because it turned out that, you know, Wooly was the guy who should have been saying what happened on the High Line that night 
not Duchess or not Emmett. You know, so it, it freed up my hand to do, make a better book. I, I don't want to, I'm not going to do this for the rest of the conversation, yep. but I do want to still drag you back towards failure a bit. Um, <laughs> what was wrong with the novel that you spent seven years oh, on? Good Lord. What a I pain for you. No, no, because I think you learn a lot. There's okay. something, you, there's so, something that no, didn't I'll, work. I'll tell you. I'll tell you, you, you yeah. right, let me, and, so, so you have to, right. to, to answer that, you ha I have to start by saying, what do I think the novel is capable of? Why do I think the novel has been a successful art form? Why do I like it? You know, what, what, how are my ambitions wrapped up in that particular art form? And in a way that one of the best ways I can do this is kind of through contrast. And that is if you think of, for a second, um, you know, the cookbook, uh, journalism, a legal brief. You know, these are three types of writing, which are nonfiction, which are a part of daily life every day, you know, for the last hundred years is a part of American life. And what they have in common, the, you know, the, the, the recipe, the legal brief, the, uh, uh, the, the, the newspaper article, is that they tend to have, uh, they're striving towards a perfect economy, right? You're, you're, if you've done those well, there's no excess language in them, right? They're telling you, they're delivered with exactly the right amount of words and instructions and information and, you know, whatever else, in the case of the legal brief, the right amounts of evidence, just to make the case, and that's it. No extra, right? And, uh, and what they also share in common is that their ultimate goal in each of these cases is that everybody in this room could read it and would come to the exact same conclusion of what they had just read. Right? And in fact, like, you know, the recipe, if you don't all end up making the same cake, that's a failed recipe. Right? We're not supposed to end up with 100 different cakes. And same thing with a legal brief. If, you're, if your lawyer writes a legal brief that, that 10 different people have a different view of what it means, that's a bad lawyer. Right? So now, the novel, or fiction generally. Nonfiction, too. Yeah, and that's true. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm not in a way it's, it's under, undercutting Michael's amazing work. But, so, <laughs> but in, the, in the case of the novel, what, what it is, is, is it shares the, uh, the aspiration to economy in those three nonfiction forms. Again, there should be no extra words, no extra scenes, no unnecessary metaphors. You know, it should be as refined to, as possible, you know, right down to the, very, you know, to the word. Um, but instead of the goal of, of it meaning the same thing to everybody in the room, the novel, hopefully, could mean something different to everybody in the room. Right? And not only everybody in the room, but could resonate with and trigger different sort of emotional responses and ideas to people of different social classes, different races, different ages, different genders, and across time. Right? And that's what, the, if you look at the great novels, and you go back early before that to Shakespeare, that's what they are. They, they are mechanisms which, have, uh, which are entertaining, are highly organic, and the feeling like everything is where it should be and there's nothing extra, but they have this enormously complex array of parts that allow different readers to focus on different elements and draw different comparisons and, and compare different images, and as a result, come to a different conclusion intellectually, emotionally, of what they've just read. And so this is the ambition. The first book was not outlined. Like I described this design process, it was not. And if you're trying to achieve what I just described, this economy where all these parts are coming together in some kind of harmonic disarray, then you got to be planning a, a, some of it. So you, you know? just wrote it. I just wrote it, right. you know? And then it was just the worst. You know? <laughs> so this is interesting to me. That, so I, I can imagine that you're, you're adrift on a sea if you're just yeah. writing. Yeah. But, it, but how did you figure out you needed to outline? Well, because part of the challenge that you discover in that book is like you get halfway into writing it, you know, now you're like in year three, and you're like, oh, I see, right, this character's that, and this book is a little bit about that, and this is where this yeah. is going to go. Well, when, I, when you have a revelation like that, in the way that I'm trying to write a book, that means going back to page one and rewriting every sentence. Because the, 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 the entire totality should be expressive of this insight. It's not like you have a new insight where you suddenly you veer and now it's a new thing, you know? You gotta go back and redesign the whole thing. So, so that's exasperating. You don't wanna do that. With the three novels you've published, you, you knew the ending before you wrote the book. Always. Day one. Were you right about the ending or did it change? I am always right about the ending. <laughs> Even when you don't like it, <laughs> I'm still right. <laughs> What I meant was, yep. did it, when you actually executed it, was the ending, 
what you yeah. would expect it well, to well, be. Inevitably, what happens is if you think of this, I have, uh, my outline usually when I start writing a novel is maybe 30 to 50 pages long. It's quite intricate and quite detailed, every step of what's going through. And, uh, and what will happen is as I'm writing the first half of the book, the second half of the outline is changing mm. and becoming more rich and bigger. Because as I'm writing the first half, I'm discovering, like we've been talking about, uh, subtleties about where this is all going, about the characters, about the events. I'm getting ideas. You're like, oh, this is great. This thing just happened in the third chapter. This is definitely going to recur later in an important way. We're going to bring this back. You know? So the outline in the back half is getting richer and richer and richer as I write the first half. Changing, evolving, shifting, but usually that North Star component mm -hmm. of where we're going to land, that's not going to change. Okay. You know, it's usually the, the North Star was right from the beginning, but we're, we're making it more interesting and complex as we approach it. So, can I say one other thing about that? Yeah, yeah. I can, right? Yeah, yeah you can. It's your, yeah. it's your show. So, so your mother says I can, right? <laughs> so, but so, but I, because I, I do, I do. Having said, I have the long outline. I know everything's going on. Blah blah blah. You know, it, it gives the wrong impression to some degree. So I want to correct that right now. Which is that that the reason I became an outliner uh, and such a, a you know m m focused on that or interested in it is a little counterintuitive. The reason I'm an outliner is because. Uh, you know, we now, we, we talk about the brain in two hemispheres. You have the left side and the right side. You know, the right side is the creative, imaginative side, the dream side. The left side is the more analytical and precise, and, you know, step-by-step -step side. And we, we use those two hemispheres in different ways and, you know, rough science there, right? You know that science better than I do, but, but it's, it's some version of that. Well, if I am writing a book, a chapter, and I have not planned the book, what you have to picture is that while I'm writing it, and I don't know what's going to happen, I don't know who's coming through the door. I don't know why they're coming through the door, what they're wearing, what they're going to talk about. Well, suddenly it's the left side of the brain that's taking over because it's all this decision making, right? You know, oh, yeah, I got to be very this specific, that specific, this reference, that, this, this name, da da da. Well, if all that's figured out, then what happens is that I can enter the chapter and let my right side of the brain just take over, which is I know it's going to happen. So I can almost go on autopilot and allow the subconscious really to derive. What's the word choice? What's the imagery? What's the tone of it? You know, what, what is the surprising thing that the character says? What's, this, what's the emotional content that I didn't anticipate? All that's kind of bubbling up, but I, I think I liberate the opportunity to maximize that by being the outliner first. You make it simple for yourself. Yeah. Without making it simple for the reader. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You're like a really well-designed football offense. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah it, you're not the first person who said that. Then, okay. <laughs> no one's ever said that. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. So the gateway drug for me was Gentleman in Moscow. Tell yeah. me how you access the 19th century Russian aristocrat. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a researcher. I'm not a research-driven writer. You're not? Yeah. Contrary to, to you know, Michael's process, oh. I don't do any, uh, really any. And I avoid, not only do I not do it, I... What research I need to do or want to do, I will only do after the first draft of a book is done. So in the case of A Gentleman in Moscow, you know, I don't speak Russian. I never studied Russian history in school. I don't have Russian heritage. Uh, I had been to Russia for 10 days in my life when I started that book, and I'd never been in the Metropole Hotel. And I decided, okay, I'll write the book, and then when I'm done, I'll take the first draft, fly to Russia, and move into the hotel, and I'll revise it while I'm there. Like, that's what I'll do. <laughs> And that's what I did. That's what I did. You actually did that? Yeah. Right. That's exactly what I did. And so the, now, <laughs> that opens up a whole lot of questions, but, uh, uh, but one of them is, um, is, is, so why did I feel like I could do this, a, a Russian book, or why would I even do a Russian book? Well, I, I had the idea of a guy trapped in a hotel. That's where I started. And I found, like many Americans, you know, my interest in Russian culture began with the discovery of the Russian novels of the 19th century. Can I stop you for real for one sec? Yeah. Why did you have an idea of a guy trapped in a hotel? Oh, I would, yeah. Where'd that come from? I, I was in, when I was in the investment business, I would go to Geneva every year for a week. I'd stay in the same hotel. I'd meet the same clients. And one year, I was walking in the hotel, and I recognized a guy in the lobby from the year before, a stranger. And I was like, God, that guy must live here. You know? <laughs> what the hell? And I'm like, this is a nice hotel, but what a bummer, you know? <laughs> and, but then in the elevator on the way upstairs, I was like, oh, yeah, that's kind of interesting. A guy gets trapped in a hotel. And this is true, because this, this, this is very typical for me. I, I, having had the in, observation lobby, it could be a book in the elevator, immediately went to my room, took out the hotel stationery, and almost all of the key events of A Gentleman in Moscow were sketched out in the next 30 minutes. Oh, my God. On six pieces of paper. 
Oh you know, my God. Oh, it's gonna be, be great. He can be a count, he's an aristocrat, house arrest, little girl, uh, the, the, the waiter, you know, da, 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 you know, da, 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 you know, all goes like that. And so, uh, and then, you know, you spend a couple of years fleshing that out. Um, but, but Without thinking you're insane. No. Yeah. N yeah, right. right. No, yeah, and, and that's why I never talk about what I'm doing with other people, because that, <laughs> cause that way you, you, you can preserve your delusion. So I do the same thing. Yeah. Don't talk about it with other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if you do, it gets, it, it, first their eyes glaze well, over. And they don't think it's possible that this yeah. is not going to work. And so yeah. it's, 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 it's you, You've got nothing to gain in that. It's disheartening. But you're going to say, what's the other reason? Because I bet it's the same as mine. What's the, what's the I get, other? I get sick of it. Yes. See, so that's the, because the, and this is a very interesting thing for young writers in the room, is that there's a certain amount of energy that you need to sustain if you're going to write work of either of our kind. You're going to be living with the material for a long period of time, revising pa passages, writing long passages by yourself, and it takes a certain amount of stamina in a way. And, and the worst thing you can do is start to talk about it. Because what you're doing when you do that is you're kind of letting yourself celebrate a little bit about how good the yeah. idea is and getting someone to say, oh, isn't that great, and whatever. And what that does is it depletes the, the urgency to finish. So you want to be doing the opposite. You want to be accumulating the you cannot wait to share this. Yeah. And so that all the energy's there because that's what you're going to need as you go back into the work for the 500th day or whatever. Who are your literary heroes? I'm turning 60 this year, so my literary heroes, it's really schools of literature that I've fallen in love with and learned from over long periods of right. time, you know? Three favorite writers. Oh, oh yeah, my, Dead my, my Dead three, three favorite books, uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace, Marquez's Hundred Years of Solitude, and uh, Melville's uh, Moby Dick. Those are my three favorites. And, and, and they're all, you can tell why, they're all sort of big and sprawling, but they're very idiosyncratic in, in their style, and, and they're very cohesive in the way that they bring everything together, all that kind of stuff I'm talking to. They're extremely rich in for imagery and poetry and, and, you know, and, and history and everything, and so, and philosophy. So anyway, I, I, those are my big books. It's hey, can I tell you, because I know we're running out of time. I know, I know we're gonna do the thing, but, but I, want, I want to share this. Yeah, go ahead. So, so Ask yourself a question. The advertise. <laughs> Thank you. The, but the, the, it's the, I'm going to make the advertisement, but it's really to tell you the story. The advertisement is that a gentleman in Moscow is, is now uh, uh, an eight-hour miniseries starring Ewan McGregor, and it premieres or airs on March 29th, so like in two weeks from last night, which is really great. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. So, but, but the reason I wanted to share this is really is, is, that, um, is that it's a long process, you know, usually book to film is a very long process, I think it was, you know, was eight years or something like that. But along the way, uh, Michael would sort of check in on it occasionally, and we were in Berkeley, and we, we you know, I went to stop into Berkeley to say, see Michael, we went hiking up on the hills, and then we went to a cafe afterwards to have a cup of coffee, you know, before you went to meet your son, and, uh, and and he says, you know, we're talking back and forth, catching up. And he says, hey, t tell me, how's the uh, Gentleman in Moscow project going? And this is like, you know, a year and a half or two years ago or something like that. Or a year and a half or something. And I said, oh, you know, it's going, re it's going really well and we're getting really close. And, uh, and you know, they just sent me uh, the drafts of the first three episodes. You know, sort of the final drafts of the first three episodes. And, you know, asking me, you know, uh, you know what I thought, asking for my input. And I said, but, you know, I, I think they're, they're probably just being polite. And there's a pause. And Michael says, Amor, they are definitely just being polite. <laughs> and not only do they not want to know what you think, they wish you were dead. <laughs> it's true. He said that. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> it's true. It's just true. I get it. No, I get there's it. no question yeah. that, 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 that you get that, the, that Hollywood's favorite yeah. writer is a dead writer. Is a dead writer. It's it's just all a, yeah. you're going to do is screw up. You're just a hassle. And you're just a hassle. You're going to take a little credit when yeah. they'd rather take it all. Yeah, exactly. You're going to complain that they were, you ruined your work of art. Yeah. You're gonna, they're going to have to listen to your ideas, which they think are dumb. Yeah. And, and the, but the big thing is. He's such a booster, right? No, no. <laughs> No, 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 but I learned. The, I was good. I, I wonder. Yeah. I, well, we're going to end on this then. But the, I wonder if you have the same feeling. Maybe you don't, because I told yeah. you my advice to you was not to meddle, and you yeah. meddled a bit. I did meddle a little bit. But, but the the my feeling is with the books that I've had been turned into movies and one miniseries, uh, that it's such a different form. Yeah. You have 300,000 words, or 100,000 yeah. words in The Gentleman well, No, you got to let them go. And, and the scripts are going to yeah. be 8,000. Yeah. It's, it's so reductive yeah. that um, they're going to have Are you going to finish tonight? Yes. <laughs> they're gonna, they have to break it and remake it into no, something true. else. And you're not really, you, yeah. to, what you've done is you've built this beautiful Swiss watch. Yeah. You're the least well-suited to yeah. break it and remake it. Yeah. Am I, 
Am I wrong? No, no, that's true. But that's wait, my last no, I, I said that I, 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 I said I wanted to end with one thing. Can I, can I just end with one thing? Okay, and I'll be quick. And that is, because we were talking about this. Like and, Grim Reaper over here. Yeah, no, it's right. okay. It's okay. <laughs> okay. What, what, I, what, I want, what I wanted to end with is, because is, it comes up with readers, and, and, it, and it's, it's, I want to talk about the role of history in my work, quickly. And, uh, and the best way that I can do this is by way of analogy. So what I want you to imagine is that you're in a theater, you know, like this, and what you're about to see is a play. You know, let's say it's a play of Chekhov's, and it's, let's say it's The Cherry Orchard. And what you're looking at is a, a living room of a, of a wealthy, you know, Russian estate in the countryside, you know, with fine furniture and everything. And at the back of the room are two French doors, and if you look through the French doors into the distance, you can see the cherry orchard itself, and it's spring, the trees are in bloom, so you can see the blossoms. Now, what, what you're looking at, of course, when you look across the stage through the French doors, is you're actually looking at painted canvas behind the doors, right? Because that's the way a set crew will make a backdrop. They're going to paint uh, a picture of this orchard and, and drop it behind the doors. Now, when they do that, they will not paint it in a hyper-realist style. They will paint it in an impressionist style, like Renoir or Monet. Or Monet because that's what's going to look right to the, to the natural eye. At that distance, it should look a little blurry, and that's going to give the, 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 the feeling that it's afternoon and maybe the, the blossoms are even moving in the breeze, you know, that impressionist execution. Now, in front of that, in front of the French doors, on either side, are bookcases made out of plywood and painted to look like mahogany. And over here is a staircase that goes up to nothing, and over there is a door that goes nowhere. Right? This is a part of the stage set. Now, but in front of all that is an actual table surrounded by actual chairs, and on the table is an actual China tea service. Now, it is very important that these things be actual, because let's say that there's a sister sitting at the table having tea by alone, and the brother slams this door as he comes in, stomping across the, the stage. He's clearly in high emotion. And what we want to we hear is when he pulls back that chair to sit down and pulls himself up, we want to hear the physicality of the wooden legs scraping across the wooden surface of the stage. And when, when he, you know, to make a point, you know, slaps the surface of the table, we want to hear the physicality of that contact. And when the sister sort of delicately, patiently puts down her teacup, we want to hear that gentle clink of the china on china. Right? And it's very important that these things be real because that's what allows us in the audience to sort of focus on this moment in a very precise way. All right, well, this is the way I construct my work, right? So for me, history is the painted backdrop, right? And when I do that, I am not interested in doing that in a hyper-realist style. I'm going to do that in an impressionist style because the role of history in my work is to give you a sense of time, of place, of mood, but that's it. Now, in front of that in my work is a lot of plywood that's been painted to look like mahogany, you know? And this is the stuff in my book that I hope that you pause and you're like, did that actually happen or did he make that up, you know? And I love that. You know, I don't want you to know the difference, right? Um, but in front of all that in my work is the actual table and chairs. And just like in the play, it's very important to me that that be very real to you. I want it to be so real to you that when, you're, when there's a scene around that table that you feel like you're sitting at the table and that you can read the changes in expression on the faces of the brother and sister, you can hear the nuances in their voices as they exchange their ideas and sentiments. And it's very important that this feel real to you for me because that's where the action is. Thank you. Amor Toll. Thank you. Thank you, my good friend.